I've been thinking about this point, and until now, I have never really been too sure about how to articulate it clearly. Until now, that is. What I'm talking about is the habit for films, TVs, and books to make the scale of certain elements bigger for the simple sake of shock and awe. On one hand, there is a perfectly reasonable explanation for doing this. A medieval battle has more weight on the face of it if there are 10,000 soldiers involved compared to 100. The increasing of the scale in this scenario creates a larger, more exciting event that tends to imply larger stakes, due to the forces that have been assembled and the presumed organisation behind such an endeavour. It's the reason why the battle at Helm's Deep is arguably more exciting than the battle at the Falls of the Rauros. However, it could also be argued that the fight at the Tower of Joy was more interesting than the Battle of Winterfell, despite the noticeably larger scale. That's because there's a little more nuance to this than meets the eye. The central issue with thinking bigger is better is that increasing the scale of something by so much diminishes the actions of our principal actors. It makes the world less realistic and believable. It disengages the narrative to prioritise spectacle over story. To borrow an example that Soviet Womble made in his video where he discussed a similar issue, in Star Wars, the original films show us the Empire dedicating galaxy-wide resources from their huge area of control to build the Death Star. It is highlighted explicitly how much effort, secrecy and time was invested into this work, and in a universe as large as this, we can believe that such a weapon could exist, and could only be built by an organisation as large as the Empire. In the sequel trilogy, the scale of said world-ending weapon is scaled up by a magnitude of 10 for Starkiller Base. On the surface, there may not seem to be an issue here, because weapons generally get bigger and more destructive, but the scaling creates a massive problem at a deeper, more fundamental level. First of all, it's been established what needs to be in place to create such a weapon, at a 10% scale, for example, but now we are supposed to believe that the First Order, effectively a rebel force with limited reach of control, which is far, far smaller than the Empire at Shadows, and therefore has access to significantly fewer resources, has managed to build a weapon that is dramatically larger, more powerful, defensible, and effective. More than that, the Death Star, despite its secrecy, was discovered by rebellion spies in advance, while its substantially larger imitator is a complete secret from the Intergalactic Republic government, which has experience with these sorts of weapons and would surely be on the lookout. Generally, when things become planet-sized, even in a huge universe like Star Wars, they become more noticeable, not less. Therein lies the first problem with scaling things up for the rule of cool, where very little consideration is taken into account for the implications that it will have on the universe, the rules that bind it, and the suspension of disbelief that the audience is required to have. As a creative person, we need to be careful that we don't fall too in love with the idea in your head and make it so big that it damages the integrity of the world that you're trying to create. Some of the best stories are the ones focused on smaller locales, not bigger, with lower stakes and more personal stories. By trying to do things bigger, you run the risk of making lots of flashy colours without much substance. Another example from the Star Wars universe would be the parallels between the battle at the end of Return of the Jedi compared to the rise of Skywalker. Not only do the First Order slash Sith Empire have a bigger fleet, again despite being a rebel hidden force, than the Empire are able to muster, but they seem infinitely more advanced and prepared. We as the audience are supposed to believe this enormous fleet could just exist without any proof as to how unlike the Empire, which is established, again, as a galaxy-spanning force with almost infinite resources. This issue of scale is then compounded when the Resistance fleet inexplicably turns up out of nowhere, and the CGI slogfest begins in earnest. Again, compare the scale. The Battle of Endor is an intimate affair. The scale is reasonable. The Rebel fleet are, well, rebels, and their fleet is scaled accordingly. It places far more emphasis on the actions of our characters, and is there to serve a plot purpose, distracting the Empire fleet while the rebels on Endor do their work. In The Rise of Skywalker, the scale of the battle is so large that it's incomprehensible. It makes for a fun trailer shot, sure, but the substance is severely lacking to the point where the battle isn't even needed beyond spectacle. 
Ray's actions alone solve most of the problems, and she arrives and is dealing with most of the issues before the Resistance fleet even rocks up. Let's contrast this with a good use of scale in the Lord of the Rings film trilogy. The battles across the three films get increasingly larger, with each subsequent film, but they never, or very rarely, drift into the unbelievable. The first film's battles, if you can call them that, are intensely close quarters, small scale skirmishes that serve to introduce us to the relative scales of the forces in this world. It is established that the enemies in this universe are almost always going to possess a numerical advantage, but lack the quality of the free peoples. The scale of the environment, on the other hand, is huge. Sweeping mountains, rivers, and forests allow us to feel the true size of the world, and thus allow more room and scope for interactions to grow. This becomes apparent in the second film, where the armies, cities, and landscapes expand once more. However, this is all done within a believable context. Rohan is a kingdom, and therefore able to field significant forces. Isengard is shown to be birthing Uruks and industrialising rapidly, guided by the established wisdom of Saruman. The settlements of Edoras, Helmsdeep, and Isengard are not so large as to be ridiculous, but are very much still grounded in a sense of reality. By the third film, the scale increases again, with the city of Minas Tirith and the size of Mordor's army. Once more, the size increases are not laughable. As much as this has been established beforehand, explained through dialogue, and shown to us as the audience. Gondor has been at war for decades. They have had centuries of building their settlements and their power base. Mordor has been preparing for its offensive for years, striking only when it's ready. The scale is massive, teetering on the edge of believability when the Oliphants are introduced, but treads the line mostly well. We are dealing with nations, peoples, and individuals that inhabit a contextually consistent universe. Of course there are faults in the films too, the scale of Legolas's achievements from climbing atop a troll, sliding on a shield and then killing under the Oliphant threaten to break the believability of the world, but these examples tend to be character focused and hold little narrative significance, as they are intended to humour us rather than add anything serious to the story. A quick historical aside to emphasise this point further. In 1899, the Eiffel Tower was completed to the jealousy of other nations around the world who fancied themselves as industrial powers. It was a potent symbol of French engineering and cultural superiority, so, naturally, in 1882, the British, determined not to be outdone, started to build their own, the Watkins Tower. It was to be 45 metres taller than its French counterpart, and therefore the ultimate middle finger across the channel. A park was developed around it, and the partial opening in 1895, with the tower well under construction, attracted 12,000 visitors, making it the most popular attraction in London that year. Not long after this, it was discovered that the foundations were inadequate to support the massive weight of the new tower. Work stopped by 1899, and the end result? A stump that only stood 47 metres tall, then nicknamed Watkins Folly or the London Stump. It was demolished in 1807, and the British settled for Blackpool Tower instead. The point here is that bigger isn't always better, despite what you may feel, and that you may want something that projects epic proportions. We need to understand that it's possible, but you have to be much more certain about the groundwork before you start building the structure. If the framework of your narrative doesn't support the grand scale of your finale or set-piece moment, it will fall flat and not crescendo to the apex that satisfies your audience. This is doubly important for any world-expanding developments you wish to include in your stories, perhaps to raise the stakes or to deepen the world. The more you expand, the more you need to reassess the assumptions that you've made in your story. To explore this a little more, let's look at Harry Potter. The Harry Potter films are a perfect example of scale done well and then ruined. I'm going to speak about the films here because we have to regrettably include the Fantastic Beast films in order to make our point. The original eight films, and seven books for that matter, are great examples of measured increase in scale, just like The Lord of the Rings. The Philosopher's Stone is very much focused on establishing a hidden world of witches and wizards that exists secretly behind our own muggle realm. It takes careful steps to show how this is possible, with invisible gateways, magical access routes, and clever muggle deception. Make note of this because it becomes important later. The first story scale is relatively limited to Hogwarts and its grounds, and Diagon Alley and the associated businesses. Everything feels close and cosy. 
We are also given our first introduction to the antagonist in this part, though not too much that we lose our curiosity. The magical elements here are also entirely functional to the point of being gimmicky. Their scale is limited to things like unlocking doors, flying broomsticks, self-stirring cauldrons, and levitating feathers. The second film, The Chamber of Secrets, starts to expand the world and magical issues. We are introduced to expanded concepts such as house elves, flying cars, and more monstrous creatures such as giant spiders, phoenixes, and basilisks. More confrontational elements of the magic are introduced such as dueling, petrification, memory wiping, possession, and polyjuice potions. The scale is increasing, but not unreasonably. The Prisoner of Azkaban is where scaling starts to speed up, as we're introduced to the Ministry of Magic, Magical Prisons, Further Creatures, Dementors, and Patronuses. We also learn more about the Wizarding War, Voldemort's fall from power, and Harry's parents. The scale starts to get a little bit out of hand, with things such as the Time Turner being introduced, which does threaten to derail many aspects of the story. Luckily, this is reined in and conveniently forgotten completely about in subsequent stories. The Goblet of Fire gives us the World Cup, Death Eaters, the Triwizard Cup. We learn about wizarding legal systems, binding contracts, dragons, and other magical schools. The world is expanding, the scale is increasing, but it is managing to navigate the path relatively well of this world still being hidden and a secret one, though those seams are starting to stretch. Order of the Phoenix introduces us to the eponymous group, but is rather restrained in its world-building scale. We get some expansion of the political and judicial systems, as well as the magical elements being more fleshed out, but overall this is a return to a more intimate story. The Half-Blood Prince expands things more, with disapparation, horcruxes, liquid luck, Voldemort's past, Inferi, and the creation of different spells such as Sceptre Sempra. The final films open the world up considerably more, and start fumbling the secrecy concept that made Harry Potter so magical and believable, as they start destroying Muggle infrastructure, establishing that the Muggle world and the magic world are actually in touch with one another. The adventures for the first time start moving outside of Hogwarts and into the wider world, and this does make the scale less distinct and clear as fights erupt in Muggle cafes and dragons fly over London. The limits of the magic in the hidden world start to creak. Ultimately, however, this doesn't massively affect the story, nor the believability, as the previous six entries have scaled up the world well. Then we get to Fantastic Beasts, where bigger is better is taken to heart. The world explodes with expansion. The Harry Potter films went to great lengths to establish this magical universe as being hidden from the Muggen world. In their efforts to make the world feel bigger in Fantastic Beasts, this concept is shattered and with it our investment in the believability of the world that has been established. In the latter films, it is shown that the Muggles are more than aware of the magic world, and even take steps to expose it further. The magic is larger and far more destructive, the magical governments are far more intimately linked with the non-magical counterparts. The wizards and witches of the world operate completely openly in the mother world, performing magic without any establishment or secrecy. The films introduce a huge roster of new creatures that are increasingly unlikely to have been known about by the Muggles. Much of this is explained away by them being invisible or some such nonsense, a lazy contrivance compared with the effort that the Harry Potter films put into showing how the magical world stays hidden. The main issue with these new films is that they become bloated and hard to follow and inconsistent with the world that we already know. We lose the intimate nature of the Harry Potter films, and the tone of these films is replaced with a myriad of ideas and themes that are hard to track and are not fully developed. When they increase the scale, mostly for the spectacle and due to the lack of originality, it hurt the universe and the enjoyment because it wasn't contextually consistent with everything we had learned from the eight films up to this point. We need to remember that the Fantastic Beasts films are set before the Harry Potter films, and therefore by making their scale so large, it undermines what has already been established in the originals. Of course, all of this doesn't mean that you can't scale things up. Of course you can. Game of Thrones, The Lord of the Rings, and the Harry Potter films, and so many others show that you can successfully increase the size of your story elements or set pieces, but you have to be confident that the foundations you're building on are solid, and that any scaling is consistent with the world you've created and the structures you've established that will be required to support it. You can approach this task by asking yourself five questions when you're considering scaling up your work. Number one, ask if the foundation of your story is strong enough to support it, 
while also remaining logically consistent and in line with the rules and world you've established. Number two, ask yourself if you've foreshadowed and planted enough hints so that the scale feels integrated and natural in the story world without jarring the audience and their expectations. Number three, you need to check if the scaling is consistent within the behaviors, actions, and decisions of your characters. Number four, you need to consider the consequences of the scaling going forward. Does it set unsustainable precedents, create plot holes or contradictions with other things that you've written? Make sure that you're reviewing everything that you've already written before you decide to scale anything up. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, does the scaling take away from the emotional core of your story by making the spectacle greater than the characters? Remember that stories are all about characters and their journeys. It's not about the spectacle. When you make things so big, it undermines the agency of your characters. If you can confidently answer these questions, then scaling may be possible in your story. But just keep track of things and be prepared to rework your narrative if you expand too much, too far. Remember that bigger isn't always better for a story and that consistency is by far the most important thing. Sometimes you need to sacrifice spectacle for the integrity and power of your story.